Welcome to the deep dive. If you're looking to get smart, fast, particularly on, you know, the really cutting edge research and academic stuff, you are definitely in the right place. Absolutely. Today, we're diving into something pretty innovative in scientific machine learning. Uh, it's called ACPCAN. ACPCAN. Okay, what's the full name? It stands for Attention Augmented Chebyshev Polynomial Kolmogorov Arnold Network. It's a new way, um, a new method for tackling partial differential equations, PDEs. Ah, PDEs, right. Those equations that pop up everywhere in science and engineering, fluid dynamics, heat, all that. And solving them, especially the complex ones, can be a real beast, numerically speaking. Exactly. And even the more modern AI approaches, things like PINs, physics-informed neural networks, they, well, they tend to hit a wall with the really tough problems. What kind of tough problems are we talking about? Things involving, say, multiple scales happening at once, or problems in really high dimensions, or, you know, strong non-linearities. They just struggle. Gotcha. So pins aren't quite the silver bullet yet for everything. Not for the really complex cases, no. And that's exactly where ACPCAN comes in. The researchers behind it, publishing on ArcSieve, are trying to directly address those limitations. Okay, so our mission for this deep dive is basically to unpack ACPCAN, figure out what makes it different, right? especially the innovations. Precisely. We want to understand how it tackles those challenges, looking closely at the uh, the architectural choices and the science behind them. All right, let's get into it. We know pins often use these standard neural networks, MLPs, multilayer perceptrons. They're generally good fungal approximators. But where do they specifically fall short with these complex PDEs? Well, MLPs are great, versatile tools, but they can sometimes struggle to capture, um, let's say, the really fine-grained structures or the long-range dependencies you find in solutions to certain PDEs. It's just hard for that architecture sometimes. So researchers are looking for ways to improve them. Yeah, pretty much two main directions. One is improving the guts of the network itself, the internal architecture used in the PIN. Okay. And the other? The other is developing smarter ways to train them these uh, external learning strategies. External learning strategies, like better ways for the AI to learn. What does that involve? It's a whole toolbox, really. You've got things like loss weighting methods, think PIN Arrow, PIN NTK, PIN RBA. They basically help the network figure out which errors are more important to fix at any given time. So it focuses its effort better. Exactly. Dynamically rebalancing things. Then you have better optimizers like multi-atom, which is built for handling, you know, those multi-scale problems we mentioned. Right. We have big changes and tiny wiggles happening together. Uh-huh. And then there are these advanced sampling strategies, AS, Ropin, Pinnacle. They're clever ways to pick the right points in the problem domain for the network to learn from. Gets more bang for the buck computationally. Smarter sampling. And you mentioned loss functions, too. Yeah, things like G-PIN and V-PIN. They feed the network more information, maybe about the gradients of the solution, or they use variational principles, just richer feedback during training. Okay, so lots of work on the training side. But you said our main focus today is more on the inside of ACPCon. The architecture. That's right. The real novelty of ACPCon lies in its core building blocks. It uses these things called Chebyshev 1CAN layers, but crucially, it augments them with attention mechanisms. Chebyshev 1CAN, okay. And attention. We hear that word a lot in AI. We do. But to really get why this is a big deal here, we need to understand a problem with just plain Chebyshev 1CAN networks on their own. It's something called rank diminution. Rank diminution. Sounds technical. What's the simple version? What does that mean for the network? Um, think of it like the network losing its expressive power, its ability to represent complex functions as you make it deeper. Layer by layer, its effective complexity shrinks. It gets less capable as it gets deeper. That seems counterintuitive. It does, doesn't it? The paper points to three main reasons why this happens. It relates to the Jacobian matrix of the network, basically how sensitive the output is to the input. That matrix loses rank. Okay, what are these three reasons? Lay them out for us. All right, first, there's a built-in limit for each single Chibi 1CAN layer. Theorem 3.1 in the paper proves mathematically that the rank of one layer's Jacobian is capped. It's limited by the input and output sizes and also by how many Chebyshev polynomials you use. So each layer has a ceiling on how much complexity it can handle independently. Got it. What's number two? Number two is the activation function that often used TAN. It's great for nonlinearity, but its derivative is always between zero and one. Theum 3.2 shows this acts like a damper. A damper. How so? It reduces the, uh, the strength of the Jacobian technically, its spectral norm and singular values. As information flows through, the network's ability to make sharp distinctions or big changes in response to input gets kind of muted, layer by layer. Okay, so limited capacity per layer and a weakening effect as you go deeper. What's the third factor? The third one is maybe the most damaging. It's how these effects combine in a deep network. 
The M3.3 shows that for a multi-layer Chebby 1 can, the rank of the whole network's Jacobian tends to decay, actually exponentially, towards just one as the network gets deeper, assuming random weights anyway. Exponential decay. Down to rank one. Whoa. That sounds really bad. It means a deep network could end up only representing changes along a single direction. That's the danger, yes. It severely limits its ability to learn complex multidimensional functions, which is exactly why the paper says there's a significant need to improve the internal structure of these Chebby 1 can based models. Okay, problem clearly established. This rank diminution is a major bottleneck. So now, how does ACP CAN tackle this? You mentioned attention mechanisms, internal and external. Let's start with the internal one. Right. The internal attention in ACP CAN is designed specifically to boost the representational power inside the Chebby 1 CAN layers to fight that rank loss. How does it do that? It computes two different feature representations from the input, let's call them U and V. It uses a linear transformations and then applies a wavelet activation function. Wavelet activation. That's not something you hear every day in standard NNs. Why wavelets? Well, wavelets are good at analyzing signals at different frequencies or scales. So the idea, presumably, is that this helps the network decompose the input features into sort of different levels of detail within these U and V representations. Okay, so it's getting a multi-scale view of the features. Something like that. The paper gives the equations U equals wavelet H0 SAU plus BU and V equals wavelet H0 SAV plus BV. Then these U and V features get integrated across the following Chebby 1 con layers using these attention coefficients. So the layers can pay attention to different parts of these U and V features. Exactly. Each layer can dynamically focus on different aspects based on these learned attention weights, IL0 and IL4. The hope is this helps preserve the richness of the information and counteracts that rank collapse. Interesting. A way to keep the information flowing effectively. Now, what about the external attention mechanisms? You said there were two, RBA and GRA. Yes, residual-based attention, RBA is the first one. This is more about the training process itself. It looks at where the network is making the biggest mistakes, the largest residuals at specific points. Residuals meaning the difference between the prediction and the target? Right. RBA dynamically increases the weight, WRBA on the loss components where those residuals are largest. So if the network is way off in one area, RBA basically tells it, hey, pay more attention here. Precisely. There's an update rule for it. WRBAIJ gets adjusted based on the size of the error lie relative to the maximum error. It creates this feedback loop. How does that help? Well, training these chippy one cans can sometimes be a bit unstable or slow. RBA helps by making sure the network prioritizes fixing its biggest mistakes first, which can lead to, you know, faster and more stable convergence. It complements the network's approximation power. Okay, that makes sense. Guide the training towards the hard part. What about the other one, GRA, gradient-related attention? What's its job? GRA tackles a different set of challenges, specifically related to using those high-order Chebyshev polynomials in the Chevy one can layers. What problems do they cause? While they make the network very flexible, high-order polynomials can lead to really large coefficients and their derivatives can get extreme. This can cause issues like a very stiff gradient flow during training or make the Hessian matrix behave badly. Stickness, meaning the optimization, it's difficult. Yeah, and also the nonlinear operations involved, like cosine and arcsine, can sometimes lead to vanishing or exploding gradients. Classic deep learning problems. Oh, those old chestnuts. So how does GRA help manage the gradients? GRA looks at the magnitude of the gradients coming from different parts of the loss function specifically. The part related to satisfying the PDE itself, the residual loss, versus the part related to fitting any known data points. And it tries to balance them. Exactly. It dynamically adjusts weights, lev GRAD, to keep these different gradient magnitudes in check. The update rule involves the ratio of the max residual gradient to the average data gradient. It promotes more balanced training. So one part of the loss doesn't completely dominate and destabilize everything? That's the idea. It helps smooth out that potentially problematic gradient flow. Now, the really interesting part is how they combine RBA and GRA. Okay, they integrate them. Into what? Into a combined mechanism they call RGA, residual gradient attention. RGA, the combined power. How does that work? The total loss function, LRGA, uses both the point-wise RBA weights and the term-wise GRA weights. The equation looks like LRGA equals lumber WRBARLR plus lumber GRAD log lumber GRAD LD. Hang on, log. There's a logarithm applied to the GRA weights. Why? Ah, yes, that's actually crucial. Those GRA weights, low GRAD, 
can fluctuate wildly, like really wide dynamic range. Figure four in the paper shows this clearly. They can go from near zero to huge values very quickly. And that caused the problems. Big problems. Without taking the log, the model just can't handle these massive swings. The paper mentions attempts at manual scaling didn't work well. And table five actually shows training can completely fail without the log. So the log transformation tames them. Exactly. It compresses that huge range, makes it much smoother, as you can see in figure six, which plots the log values. This allows the model to balance the loss terms more effectively without being thrown off by these sudden huge changes in the GRA weights. Very clever. Okay, so we have internal attention fighting rank loss and external RGA guiding the training and handling gradient issues. How does this whole ACP CAN package perform in practice? on tough PDEs. They really put it through its paces, tested it on five PDEs known to be tricky for regular pins, the so-called pin failure modes. Which ones? Things like the 1D wave equation, 1D reaction, 2D Navier-Stokes flow around a cylinder that's a classic 1D conviction diffusion reaction, and the 2D Navier-Stokes lid-driven cavity problem. Yeah, those are definitely benchmarks people use to stress test methods. How did ACP can do compared to others? The results look really strong. Table 1 in the paper summarizes it, and Figure 2 has visualization. ACP can significantly outperformed pretty much all the baseline models they compared against. Baselines like standard pins or other advanced ones? Both. Standard pins, other CAN variants without the attention, and even methods like PinsFormer. ACP can consistently got the lowest or second lowest test errors. Wow. So it generalizes better. Finds more accurate solutions. That's what the results strongly suggest, yeah. And interestingly, the paper notes that many of the other models often got stuck in local minima during training. Ah, uh, the classic training trap. Does ACP can avoid that better? They mentioned a figure five. Yes, figure five in the appendix tries to visualize the loss landscape for the 1D wave equation. For ACP can, it looks noticeably smoother compared to Chebby 1 can, F can, and others. Smoother meaning fewer bumps and valleys to get stuck in? Exactly. A smoother landscape generally means the optimizer has an easier path to finding a good solution, suggesting better training stability for ACPCon. Better accuracy and more reliable training. That's a good combo. Did they test it on anything beyond these sort of academic benchmarks, like more realistic engineering problems? They did. They tackled three scenarios specifically chosen because they are known to be hard for pins in more applied settings. Such as? First, a heterogeneous Poisson problem that means the material properties inside the domain change from place to place. Second, a complex geometric Poisson problem, think a rectangle with holes punched out of it, specifically four circles. And third, a 3D point cloud Poisson problem, which involved a Helmholtz type equation on a cube with spherical bits removed using sparse point data. Those definitely sound more like messy, real-world situations. How did it handle those? Very effectively, according to the paper. It managed the varying properties, the complex boundaries, and even the sparse 3D data, solving the Toisson equations successfully in all these challenging contexts, showed real robustness. That's quite impressive. So the empirical results look good. Is there any theory behind why it works so well? especially regarding overcoming that rank diminution. Yes, there is. Appendix B dives into the theory. A key result is theorem B.5. It basically states that if you imagine an ACP can with infinite width, a theoretical ideal, of course, its Jacobian matrix achieves full rank almost everywhere in the input space. Full rank meaning it retains its maximum possible expressive power. Essentially, yes. It doesn't suffer that collapse. This is linked to the idea that with infinite parameters, you can construct enough independent basis functions and orthogonal weights. Equations 105 to 111 detail this. Okay, infinite width is theoretical, but it points to strong potential. Does this full rank property hold up as you stack layers? The paper argues yes, through an inductive proof that's equations ver 12 to 115, they show the full rank property propagates through the network layers. And what does full rank mean practically? Well, using the rank nullity theorem, full rank implies the mapping is injective when you have enough outputs meaning different inputs generally lead to different outputs. The network doesn't just collapse distinct inputs onto the same lower dimensional space, except maybe on some very small measure zero set. It maintains its ability to distinguish inputs. So theoretically, it has the capacity to learn very complex mappings without that crippling rank loss. Okay, switching gears slightly, what about efficiencies? Does all this extra attention machinery make it super slow or memory hungry? The paper touches on it briefly. A single Chebby 1 can layer has a time complexity related to batch size, dimensions, and the number of polynomials. Memory depends on storing coefficients and activations. 
and the attention adds to that. It inevitably adds some computational overhead, yes. But the argument is that the significant performance boost, the better accuracy and stability on hard problems, likely justifies that extra cost in many situations. They do provide actual running times for their experiments in Table 8 in the appendix, which gives a more concrete idea. Right, a trade-off. Maybe more compute, but for better results. Are there known limitations or directions for future work? The authors themselves point out a couple of things. First, they used a standard optimizer, Adam W. They suggest that optimizers designed specifically for cans might improve performance even further. Custom optimizers for cans. Interesting. What else? Second, the current ACP can doesn't use pruning. Cans have potential for interpretability, and pruning removing unnecessary connections could help realize that by simplifying the learned network. So exploring specialized optimization and pruning are flagged as future work. Always good to see where things might go next. They also had an experiment just fitting a complex function, right? What was that about? Yeah, Appendix H.2, Figure 7, they fit a noisy, piecewise 1D function. It was really about testing the basic interpretation ability of ACP CAN compared to other models when learning from noisy data, showcasing its function approximation power beyond just PDEs. Table 9 compares parameter counts for that. So it's fundamentally good at learning complex shapes from data, too. Seems so. And just to add a bit more context on the experiments, the paper gives details on the exact PDE setups for the failure modes like the 1D wave and 1D reaction equations, the data-free training approach using collocation points. And for the engineering problems too. Yes. More details on the heterogeneous materials, the exact geometry of the domain with exclusions, the specifics of the 3D point cloud setup, the boundary conditions, training epochs, hyperparameters for RBA. They provide a lot of that in the appendices, including tables 13 and 14, aim for reproducing producibility. Good, good. Details matter. Okay, so let's try to wrap this up. The key takeaway seems to be that ACP CAN is a significant step forward. I think so, yes. The core idea is that smart combination of internal attention fighting rank loss within the Chibi 1 CAN structure and external attention RBA and GRA bundled as RGA guiding the training and managing gradients. And this combination really seems to work, tackling problems where older methods, even sophisticated ones like PINs, struggled both on benchmark failure modes and more realistic complex engineering scenarios. Exactly. The empirical results are quite compelling, and it's backed by that theoretical argument about achieving full rank, suggesting it has the inherent capacity for high expressivity. Right. So as we finish this deep dive, it really gets you thinking, doesn't it? These kinds of advancements, mixing architectures, adding sophisticated attention, how could this change the game for solving really complex scientific and engineering problems? Especially, like you said, in situations with maybe limited data or really intricate physics or complex geometries, it opens up possibilities. So the provocative thought for you, the listener, might be, where does this lead? We're seeing these hybrid approaches combining strengths of different AI ideas. What other novel combinations might emerge? How else could we engineer neural networks to better capture the fundamental laws governing complex systems? It's definitely an exciting frontier in scientific machine learning, constantly evolving and pushing the boundaries of what we can simulate and understand. A space to watch, for sure.